believe in a limited government. I believe the government has a responsibility to protect consumers. I believe in a flat tax rate. I believe in progressive taxation. I believe that there are two genders. I believe that there are many genders and that we should all be allowed to define ourselves. I remember being asked to give a TED talk. I was excited, like really excited everyone. So when I was asked if I would give the talk with another girl who had a similar topic to mine, I was immediately game. Keep in mind, at this point, we had never met before. On that first introductory Zoom call, my first impression of Ella was that she was kind and well-spoken, though I knew it was going to be likely that we disagreed on politics. I was a little bit more judgmental. I remember on that first Zoom call, I was trying to size Zena up before she even opened her mouth. I looked at her hair, her clothes, what she had on her, and the American flag in her background, and honestly, I was just a little bit doubtful because she didn't look like someone with whom I could agree. But that was the intention. They informed us that they wanted to make this talk not only advice on how to solve this issue, but an example of it. Now, I won't pretend that Dina and I have totally come together on every issue, and honestly, I won't even pretend that I would vote for her in an election. But I like and respect Dina as a person, and we've been able to come together with the common goal of urging you to do the same. There's no doubt that in the United States, there are different opinions and beliefs. Oftentimes, these are held really, really closely. Alas, when they are challenged, this can lead to hostility, arguments, and just blatant disrespect. We've all experienced this at some point or another. Tina and I have been in similar environments for most of high school. Left-leaning schools where the student body is made up mostly of upper-middle to upper-class students. And we've had very different experiences in this environment. For example, I attend an academically rigorous public school, which is pretty much the exact stereotype of a rich school. In terms of cultural, racial, or economic diversity, well, suffice it to say, it's not exactly our strong point. Despite that, however, we do have a good mix of political beliefs. And that's greatly benefited me because it's taught me that I don't have to agree with everyone in order to get along with them and to work together. And I believe that I'm in the vast majority of students in saying that my political beliefs have generally been respected at school. Since eighth grade, I have attended an academically rigorous private school, very similar in culture and student body to that of Ella's. Upon entering high school, I began exploring different political thoughts and ideas. And while I don't really like political labels, I would consider my views to fall generally under the umbrella of libertarian conservative. When I made this ideological shift, something strange happened. People more or less stopped talking to me. I was socially ostracized. Now, this could just be because people thought of me as being one of the weird kids. And in all honestly, honesty, that's probably very true. But the sad reality of the situation is that I've talked to other current students and alumni who have beliefs that are just kind of different than the norm. And they tell me that while at this school, they were or are scared to share their views because of the heavy social ramifications. But political hatred is not just on an individual basis. In 2017, a Pew Research poll found that 81% of Americans view the other political party, quote, very unfavorably. And that same poll found that one half of Republicans and two thirds of Democrats have quote, few or no friends in the other political party. And that's a big part of the problem. There's absolutely hate and hostility towards people on the other side of the aisle. The right hates the left, left hates the right, libertarians are off doing who knows what, but either way we see this hate manifest everywhere in our current climate. On social media, the news, or just in casual conversation, there's an acute with us or against us attitude. And in the case that you're against us, then you're portrayed more or less as the devil reincarnate. We have all heard before why this is important. The country is dividing along ideological lines and things like civility, decency, or just a respect of a common humanity is being lost. So if this issue is so perverse that it endangers the very existence of our country, why are we so incapable of considering a compromise? If it's so huge that it is wearing away at the soul of our democracy, why are we so incapable of stopping taking a breath, and addressing the problem. There are a lot of reasons for this, and the two of us don't even agree on that. For example, many commenters, such as Ezra Klein, blame simple human nature. In the youth of our species, humans were hunted, and thus our instincts told us that exclusion from the group meant death. The problem is, we don't know how to, ha how to turn off that instinct. So no matter what a member of our political party does, we're inclined to exclude it, because not doing so puts us in direct conflict with members of our group. In this case, our friends, family, and coworkers. Or maybe it's because many of us are likely to exclude those you would have agreed with on the basis of presumed political party alone. 
History has shown time and time again that not being familiar with a group makes it far easier to villainize the other. Or maybe it's because of the geographic distances between liberals and conservatives, which starts a cycle where one person says a belief and they're vilified for their whole community, and it just goes round and round with everyone hating each other. My theory on this topic looks slightly different. Examining the American social landscape over the past 100 years, I see religious institutions as being the backbone of our social fabric. Whether this be a church, mosque, synagogue, or temple, these organizations have been home to strong communities with a common belief. Oftentimes within these institutions, there are differing political ideas, yet the common ideology holds the group together. Over the past 20 years, we have seen the rate of religiosity in church or just other religious institution attendance plummet. At this same time, as Ella mentioned, people still crave to be part of a group. What I suspect is that we have turned to political parties as a replacement. So how do we fix the societal tension? We propose having conversations. A buddy of mine and I teach a class at our synagogue's religious school dedicated to teaching kids about tikkun olam, which is a concept in Judaism that means repairing the world. Around the time of the election, we taught a lesson on how to have conversations with people you disagree with. The framework we created, while targeted towards kids, is applicable for all ages. Our theory breaks down into five things to practice to have a good and meaningful conversation. The first is being respectful. Now, this seems super simple to most people, yet in reality, it is the reason why so many seemingly innocent conversations turn to yelling matches. Being respectful means just acknowledging that the other person has their own thoughts and feelings. And while you may disagree with them on something, or everything, it is important to treat them as another human being, not an enemy. After that comes empathy. Practicing empathy in conversation means just acknowledging that the other person has maybe had different life experiences that have led them to their conclusions. Then there is reason. Now, reason is something that is trampled over these days, yet it is one of the most important things in having an actually quality discourse. Using reason means trying to be logical, avoiding logical fallacies, character jabs, and instead trying to make a well-formed argument, and at the same time, trying to understand theirs. To understand another's argument, it is vital to use the next tool, listening. <laughs> listening is something that is absolutely preached to us when we are younger, yet it seems that once we get older, we forget just how important it is. Through listening, you can truly understand another's point of view, and you avoid just jumping to conclusion based on preconceived notions about their perspective. Lastly is grace. Grace manifests itself in a couple ways in a conversation. The first is realizing that you may not always be right and that it's okay to change your perspective. The other facet of this is being okay with disagreement. Now, this can be really challenging, especially on those topics which you know you're right about, but it is absolutely essential. But it's not just having conversations with others that is important. We're to combat political hatred in our everyday lives. We have to go to the source, to our own subconscious thoughts. We have to have conversations with ourselves. Now, I know that sounds a little insane, but stick with me here. Most of us don't look at someone we perceive to be part of the other political party and think, well, they look like a Republican. I'm not going to talk to them. More accurately, we look at someone, look at their clothes, their hair, what they have on them, and make subconscious calculations. Pink hair, plus NYC t-shirt, plus art portfolio equals Democrat, equals communist, equals crazy. So we choose not to interact with that person. And long sleeve shirt, plus cross necklace, plus long jean skirt, equals Republican, equals homophobic, equals crazy. So we choose not to interact with that person. But really, we don't know anything about them. Maybe they are a member of the other political party. Maybe that just really doesn't mean that much to them. Maybe it does, but maybe it just wouldn't have been an issue between the two of you. And maybe you'll find that you're able to work on important projects together, like writing a TED Talk, for example. So I'd ask you to take a moment when you automatically count someone out and consider your own thought process. Here's a method I've learned through the trials of anxiety. Firstly, Pause and allow yourself to think through your own thought process unhindered by outside influences. Secondly, really think through that process. Ask yourself questions like, why did I think this about them? Was it something in their appearance? Or do I really need to feel uncomfortable around them? 
And asking yourself these questions, it's important to be completely honest with yourself. It's just for you, and no one else will hear it, so it's okay if you're disappointed in the answers. And finally, let yourself be imperfect. More than likely, you've had a time where you've been guilty of political hatred, and that's okay. What's important is checking yourself, learning from it, and trying to move past it. And if you're doing that, then you're on the right path. Like we mentioned before, Ella and I did not know each other before doing this talk, and we were more or less forced into working together. But <laughs> throughout the process of writing this talk, we realized that we are very, very similar people, even if we disagree on essentially every single political issue imaginable. It is possible, and it is important, to be able to look past your political disagreements and see the other person as just that, another person. And through the process of writing this talk, we learned that there are way more important things to disagree and argue on. For example, Ella, for some reason, doesn't like carrots. <laughs> and you guys are not going to believe this, but Dina somehow thinks that Star Trek is better than Star Wars. Ella's opinions on this issue make me a little uncomfortable, just saying. And regardless of our friendship, Gina's views on gender, on gender identity are something that I strongly disagree with. And I disagree with Ella on government involvement, but... We both have a common love of Sam Gamgee, The Hobbit, and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Ultimately, you don't have to agree on the big things. You don't even have to agree on the little things. And he won't be friends with everyone. But we can't continue to hate each other like this. Because if we don't communicate, then we can't solve the issues that we all want to just see resolved. We hope that you'll walk away from this talk willing to evaluate your thoughts and actions towards others. And we hope that that will lead you to understand others a little bit more. All right. Are we doing a socially distanced high five? <laughs>